Our story begins as follows. One afternoon, he said, when I was completely dispirited and disgusted, I stopped work and went out for a walk. In a print shop window I noticed an engraving after one of the old masters. I do not remember what picture it was. I could not then analyse that which attracted me to it, but it fascinated me. The print seller showed me others, and they repeated the same sensation in me. There was a power of motive, a bigness, and a grasp in them. They were nature, rendered grand instead of being belittled by trifling detail and puny execution. I commenced to take them out to nature with me, to compare them with her as she really appeared, and the light began to dawn. He knew he was merely producing coloured drawings, and thinly coloured ones at that, but he knew what he needed to do. But how to get there? George Innes began early to realise his position and role in life, was destined to be a painter, born in Newburgh, New York, on May the 1st, 1825. At the time it was a small town situated on the banks of the Hudson River. His father managed a farm of several acres, and was a grocer by trade. George was the fifth son of a family of thirteen children. He suffered from illness as a child with epileptic bouts, which he outgrew, but his energies were boundless. He became an omnivorous reader, and drew constantly. To the point that his father sought instruction for him with a local artist, George left school at fourteen years old, due to his lack of interest and poor grades, and because his drawing took precedence over school studies. So, his first teacher was a Mr. Barker, which little is known of him today, but it gave direction to the point he stated he had learned all he could teach him, at which time George took at sixteen, a position of a map engraver for the firm of Sherman and Smith in New York. After a brief two years at the firm, he decided enough was enough, and he opted to travel and paint the surrounding hills, woods, and fields of northern New Jersey, where his father had retired recently with his family on twenty-five acres, experimenting on his canvases unaided, producing many experiments of colour, but at the same time storing up mental images and impressions to serve a future need. His trend from the first was toward landscapes, and in this great open book of nature he may be said later to have founded a new american school his single course of instruction at this time was a very few weeks spent in the studio of regis Gignou, a french landscape painter of some note who had lately established a studio in new york ines was then in his twentieth year it should be noted that regis francois Gignou was a distinguished nineteenth-century artist whose work celebrated the uplifting aspects of the American landscape. Born in Lyon, France, Gignou trained at the Académie des Beaux-Arts in Paris, where his instructor, the history painter Paul Delaroche, encouraged his interest in landscape painting. He travelled to the United States in 1840 in pursuit of an American woman and became entranced with the American wilderness, devoting himself to both the woman who became his wife and the country, Gignou settled in New York and painted the grand sites of the United States, including Niagara Falls, the Catskill Mountains, Mount Washington, and Mammoth Cave in Kentucky, where he became famous for his winter landscapes. George knew such instruction as this, however, was practically valueless, not only on account of the short time given to it, but also by reason of Innes's own temperament and decided ideas of his own so we may say that his genius grew in native soil without conventional culture or pruning save at his own hands. It was as natural for Innes to paint as it was for him to breathe, said a close associate of his, Elliot Dangerfield, stating. He painted because he could not help it, and in his own way. He had no perpetual teachers beyond his personal experience and observation, and he also had no pupils, he was his own exponent from first to last. It is interesting to note that while studying in New York, Ines lived at the Astor House and paid his board in pictures. Some of his earliest pictures were painted at the home of his brother, James Ines, in Pottsville, Pennsylvania. Amid these days of early and bitter struggle in New York, the artist turned aside to romance, and like many another who can scarcely earn a living for himself, he married. The details attending this romance are meagre, 
but sad the bride contracted a cold upon her wedding day which soon developed into consumption and in six months she passed away the following year he married again this time more fortunately for his wife proved a helpmeet to him during all his life finally in 1847 the way was opened he found a valuable friend and patron in a dry goods auctioneer by the name of Ogden Haggerty who not only bought his pictures but advanced the funds necessary for his European journey the elated young artist proceeded first to London and there trod the same ground from gallery to gallery which Stuart Alston Trumbull and others of the West school of 70 years before but his ideals were different from theirs he represented a new American movement both in the type and quality of his work which was to shake itself free from foreign tradition and rest upon the bedrock of nature alone after a short time spent in London he went on to Rome where he lingered for 15 months a period of unflagging delight whether spent visiting the rare art treasures or wandering over the picturesque countryside his mind was filling up with images and impressions to serve him later Florence claimed him for a time and then he returned to America his style still unformed yet breaking little by little through the mature restraints it was at this time that pictures by foreign painters were beginning to reach the United States in any appreciable quantity the few which Innes saw soon set him to hungering for Europe afresh and selling what pictures he could complete in a short time he again set sail across the Atlantic this time he went to Paris where he speedily fell under the influence of the French school as exemplified by Millet Rousseau Daubigny and Corot Millet was then 35 10 years older than Inès and the young American thought him to be the greatest figure painter that ever lived he could not appreciate Millet's landscapes but the figures homely or indistinct though they might be revealed for him the very essence of human feeling Rousseau also was a subject of his most profound admiration this first year spent in Paris was in a word of the utmost service to him it seemed to supply many things he had hitherto needed and left him well on the road from apprenticeship to master painting on his return to America he spent four years in New England amid the lovely rural scenery round about Medfield Massachusetts then for a third time he went abroad for a few months more and upon his return made his home at Eaglewood New Jersey all these adventures here and yonder were but the visible marks of a soul in its growth they were years of struggle inwardly and outwardly when the art of today became the doubtful theory of the morrow at one time three of his older brothers kept him afloat for a year by buying his pictures and selling them again when and where they could neither at this time nor at any other did he have the remotest idea of the value of money and to relieve him of one distress was but to provide the means for him to fall into another his contempt for the mercantile life was amusingly blunt one of his earliest theories was that all trade was under obligations to sustain art and that the merchants were created to support the artists something still in the minds of artists today during his residence at Eaglewood in the early 60s Innes took up the study of theology and metaphysics a fact which deserves careful mention as it exercised the most profound influence over his art as a boy he had been a dreamer visionary recluse a student of nature as a man he turned his thoughts to books of profound philosophy and to the study of his fellow man for seven years he read nothing else his splendid intellect reveling in the difficult fields which had unfolded to him his environment during his childhood and youth was extremely well calculated to give such a tendency to his active temperament and thinking his mother who died in his fifteenth year was a Methodist and brought up her children in strict compliance with it at Eaglewood George came in touch with a congenial fellow artist William page and also found a valuable agent in Marcus spring a singular character of the day spring came from a well-known family and was practically the founder of Eaglewood he conducted a military school and our modern manual is based largely upon his system it was at his invitation that Innes located there 
and the curious arrangement made suited the artist's easy-going ways exactly mr spring provided ines with his living expenses while ines turned over his pictures as fast as they were painted to spring who sold them as opportunity offered it is stated that some of these paintings still come to light from time to time in 1868 ines was elected a member of the national academy of design after having been an associate for some fifteen years he went abroad for the fourth time in 1871 remaining four years were divided between paris and rome in each of these foreign visits he seems to have gained something which took him astride farther in his work yet there is no man whom he can be said to have copied or imitated he gleaned the best from both the old and the new and brought to bear upon it his own intellectuality and close sense of nature there was no painter who was more intimate with the varying moods of field and forest and to interpret these moods seemed to him to be the highest duty imposed on man art is an essence as subtle as the humanity of god said he and like it is personal only to love a stranger to the worldly minded a myth to the mere intellect i would not give a fig for art ideas except as they represent what i in common with all men need most the good of our practice in the art of life rivers streams the rippling brook hillsides sky and clouds all things that we see will convey the sentiment of the highest art if we are in the love of god and the desire of the truth at another time he said the purpose of the painter is simply to reproduce in other minds the impression which a scene has made upon him a work of art does not appeal to the intellect it does not appeal to the moral sense its aim is not to instruct but to awaken an emotion its real greatness consists in the quality and force of this emotion ines spent the first year after his return in boston where his art had already found admirers then he moved permanently to new york setting up his easel in the holbein studios on west 55th street but the jersey hills just across the hudson which had been the scene of many a boyhood ramble called him again insistently and obeying their summons he turned to them for rest and inspiration and a home for his family like many another victim of the comic papers he became a commuter, spending his hours of grind amid the roar of the rapacious city and the golden hours of freedom amid rural surroundings congenial to his art he found a roomy frame house in montclair a dozen miles out and here he spent the closing years of his life by this time the painter had come into his own though the journey had been long and arduous public recognition came late and while a few collectors had prized his canvases almost none had thought it worth while to make a business of collecting them but from 1875 on the tide turned more and more in his favor and his prices rose correspondingly in 1867 the paris salon had selected his american sunset as a representative work of american art he had also two distinct methods in early life he was painstaking later he worked broadly with an eye to the general effect he particularly excelled in cloud tree and sky subjects his method of working was peculiar he would always paint standing and while he began rapidly and nervously his speed would diminish and his nerves steady as he advanced as the difficulty of his subject grew upon him he would work slower and slower till finally with a grunt of impatience he quit the subject entirely for the time being and set himself at a new one there were invariably a dozen or more pictures in various stages of completion in his studio occasionally in a happy mood he would paint steadily till one was finished more often he would turn aside to complete one with an entirely different subject frequently a picture far advanced and perhaps even completed would arouse his dissatisfaction and he would fall to and alter it completely his peculiar energy and nervous excitement at his work on such occasions had about it the suggestion of a battle and indeed it was a battle the artist was fighting with the impulse of genius to nerve his hand merely to look at the portrait of this man with his lion-like mane and careless attire suggests the shock of battle trumbull thus describes him 
he was a man of the middle stature of a spare frame with a face full of character and gray penetrating eyes he wore the thin beard of a man whose face had never known the touch of the razor and his broad brow was framed in a mass of long and always disorderly hair he was careless in his dress so that the picturesque ensemble of head and figure was not disturbed invincible is perhaps the one word that defines george innes's character arrogant he has been called but falsely egotistical selfish and all the other phrases that unsuccessful jealous minds usually apply to those who are intolerant of false efforts and falser success where alone truth is the aim and truth the goal never once in all my long acquaintance with him have i known in a satisfied with the work of his times without number i have seen a new light flash in his eyes a quick eager toss of the head and thrusting back of the hair when some problem with which he had been struggling for days or months perhaps years was yielding under the sway of his fierce energy then it was he gave vent to those expressions of satisfaction which have been called conceit but mark you when the morning came or the new mood be that canvas never so fine if one thing there jarred on the man's artistic sensibility he attacked it with all the old enthusiasm with a dogged determination to bring it to his own high standard his moods were so well known to me that i could readily tell from his very knock at my door whether i was to be taken off across the hall to his studio to view some great advance in his picture or whether he was to drop into a chair in silence for a while worn tired and with that depression of spirit which only the artistic nature can understand at such a time one word upon some abstract theme no matter what if really serious would stir him into life and intense speech it would not be argument as between two for when innes talked the flame needed no draught it blazed and flared until his own conclusions were reached and then faded even as the glow on some of his own forest trees seemed to fade in the twilight time until the deep silence left no room for speech he came into my studio one day with all the unrest and nervous eagerness which characterized him when thinking intensely threw out several sentences about his picture and its purpose then with a sort of mad rush he said what's it all about what does it mean this striving this everlasting painting 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 away one's life what is art that's the question i've been asking myself and i've answered it this way i drew a writing pad to me and jotted down his words they are worth thinking about oftener than once art is the endeavor on the part of mind to express through the senses ideas of the great principles of unity perhaps no more characteristic sentence has ever been recorded of him it satisfied him he had made his conclusion and expressed it did not propose to supply us with brains to understand what the principles of unity may be we might struggle as we pleased with that problem as perhaps he had struggled with the other although to a tyro the last seems exactly the same as the first art religion and the single tax theory were his chief themes and by a curiously interesting weaving his logic could make all three one and the same thing oblivious to externals both of persons and things he often said and did much that evoked harsh criticism but at heart it may be truthfully said he was as gentle as a child even tender and swiftly sympathetic what a delight it was to watch him paint in one of those impetuous moods which so often possessed him the colors were almost never mixed he had his blue theories black umber and in earlier days bitumen he even had an orange chrome phase with a great mass of color he attacked the canvas spreading it with incredible swiftness marking in the great masses with a skill and method all his own and impossible to imitate here there all over the canvas rub rub dig scratch until the very brushes seemed to rebel but stand here fifteen feet away what a marvelous change is there a great rolling billowy cloud sweeping across the blue expanse graded with such subtle skill over the undertone vast trees with sunlight flecking their trunks meadows ponds mere suggestions but beautiful foregrounds filled with detail where there had been no apparent effort to produce it delicate flowers scratched in with the thumbnail or handle of the brush one's imagination was so quickened that it supplied all the finish needed Elliot Dangerfield continues I once had the good fortune to paint a little picture that pleased him he caught sight of it 
lying on the floor against the wall and exclaimed hello who did that i told him stooping down he caught it up pushed his glasses far back on his head examined it with many expressions that i remember with deep satisfaction put it down again and walked out of the room the next morning he came in again and taking up the picture asked what do you expect to get for that i mentioned a price thinking he meant to advise someone to buy it but he answered at once i'll take it walked to the desk and made out a check then as if he meant to help me still farther up the hill he caught up my palette and brushes and for an hour painted a figure on the picture which i had thought finished to show me how it ought to be done i have never touched that picture it remains a souvenir of the day i had my biggest lesson in art in his conversations especially on art he was always concise and he always had something worthwhile to say i never knew a man whose off-hand thoughts were so well worth preserving said george william sheldon and i never took a stroll with him without wishing that some invisible scribe might make a report of his talk for the benefit of art students innes's intellectual ideas were always great and noble and the ideas reflected upon his canvases reflect this nobility he had no sort of use for mediocre work which he characterized as intellectual dishwater he took no part in the societies to which he belonged beyond sending pictures to the exhibitions and for prizes or medals he had an outspoken contempt he believed that the pursuit of art was its own reward if you think to work to do your best he said the world does not then appreciate you what satisfaction can a diploma or a medal bring they are only the recognition of a few men who appreciate you anyhow and they go to so many who are not worthy of them that they do not carry any real significance to those who may deserve them pass your verdict upon yourself if you are capable of criticizing yourself the verdict of the world will be passed in due time and it will be a just one even if it does not sustain that of prize committees and juries of award innes worked and studied up to the last his ill health as a boy and young man had been successfully combated by his life in the open air so that he all but rounded his three score and ten he died while on a tour abroad at the bridge of allen scotland on august third eighteen ninety four his wife a son and a daughter survived him his son george innes was born in paris in eighteen fifty four and studied with his father in rome the father lived to see the son take high rank among contemporary artists the daughter married jonathan scott hartley the sculptor and academician no artist need fear that his work will not find sympathy if only he works earnestly and lovingly these words of the painter might fittingly have been inscribed upon innes's monument for they strike the keynote of his life with him art was no mere vocation it was his religion and he pursued it with all the fierce passion of a devotee and finally we hope you enjoyed this episode on the great landscape artist george innes as much as we did in learning more about him and his artwork so with that thank you to our subscribers and remember to leave a like so we can grow the channel until next time bye for now mm -hmm.